Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I have a fascinating author to introduce you tonight. Her name is Susan Wad, and uh, she is an award-winning author. Uh, she is in Ontario, and she's written a book that lines up with uh, Sexual Health Week, uh, which is uh, next week. And uh, it's a novel called What the Living Do uh, by Regal House Publishing, uh, and it grapples with women's reproductive rights and sexuality, as well as survivors' guilt. Um, uh, one of the uh, people that have uh, reviewed the uh, the book said, Susan Wads has written a fierce and fearless novel about a woman drawn to self-destruction yet desperate to live, and maybe even love a deeply moving and memorable debut. Sex and death consume much of the 37-year-old Brett Catlin's life. Cole, 10 years, her junior takes care of the former uh, while her job disposing of roadkill addresses the latter. A cancer diagnos diagnosis causes her to question her worth. Suspecting the illness is payback for the deaths of her mother, of her father and sister, thus beginning a challenging journey of alternative healing that she doubts she deserves. Just as Brent surrenders to the prescribed cure, a sterling discovery sends her on a more profound exploration of cause and effect. Encounters with animals, both living and dead, help her answer the question, who is worth saving? Fascinating. How did you... Susan, welcome to the, uh, to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. How did you get motivated to write this book? Well, uh, part personal and part one of those things that a lot of us do is we think what if so the character came to life from uh, a comment that somebody once made about how roads workers women on the roads tended to be hot blondes and I thought wait a minute <laughs> wait a minute uh, what if what if she wasn't just a sign turner but what if she was an actual road worker and had to do the dirty job of you know filling potholes and scraping roadkill off the road what would that person be like the situation that you described in the synopsis of the book um is is personal to me because uh there is a very pervasive feeling uh in life and i think it goes back to biblical times that illness itself is payback is a punishment we deserve the illness that we get illness is a payback it's karma it's punishment yeah you deserve it you deserve it god either god sent it down or it's karma or you did something really heinous in this life um so i had a cervical cancer as this character finds out that she has and that's the thing that she grapples with and i also tried a lot of alternative healing and even in the alternative healings that i experienced there was also this pervasive thing that there was something essentially wrong with me that I had to fix in my soul before I could heal that, that the cancer had manifested itself because, uh, because in, in this case, these, this uh, sort of new age healing that I was doing, uh, that I had some great desire to prove myself that I wasn't receptive. So it was a real core thing that, um, that I had to look at. But also, even in the pamphlets that they give you for the causes, the sources of, of you know, why we have cervical cancer, it sort of laid blame on the woman that it was because of multiple partners or it was because sex happened too early in their life. Um, so, that, so that comes through in the book where she reads this pamphlet and goes like, oh, okay, so it's my fault. And, and then, um, but then she goes back into her history of, a fire that claimed the lives of her father and her baby sister that she feels not responsible for the fire, but definitely for the deaths uh, because she was mean to her baby sister. So she carries that through. So when she finds out she has cancer, it's like, oh, well, okay, maybe I, maybe I should just let it take me. That was. What up? Fascinating, but scary book. Uh, is, is, is it fun to read? I don't know. I mean, my character, she's a little scrappy. Uh, she's a lot more scrappy than I personally am. I'm, I tend to be, I don't know. I'm not so scrappy. Um, and not so, uh, I didn't really think I deserved to die. <laughs> so, um, but she, she I, I mean, it's fun too. I mean, there's a lot of actually really juicy sex in it. She uses her partner who's 10 years younger than her 
sort of as a soother, like, you know, it's, uh, um, it's her way of, so there, you know, that part's fun reading about the sex. <laughs> Sounds like an interesting book. If if uh, people are interested in it, where can they uh, buy it? Well, it's available for pre-sale on Amazon. Uh, if they're in the U.S., they can buy it directly from the publisher, Regal House Publishing. Um, and it will be available for wide open sale on March 19th. And I have, uh, where are you located? I'm in uh, Mississauga. Okay, so I have four launches coming up. I have one in Aurelia on March 24th. I have one in Toronto on April 4th, one in Uxbridge on April 13th, and one in Peterborough on the 20th. So you can come and meet me and um, be listened to. In, uh, and in each one of those, I have some marvelous other authors that I'll be in discussion with, including Excellent. the the first two, Richard Scrimger, who's a marvelous uh, young adult writer. We're, we're going to take a break for some messages. We'll be back in just two minutes with uh, uh, Susan Wads talking about her uh, her book, which sounds like it's a pretty fascinating one. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Susan Wad, and she has uh, got a stunning new novel called What the Living Do, which grapples with women's reproductive rights and sexuality, as well as survivor's guilt. Fascinating. Uh, Susan is the winner of the Writers Union of Canada Prose Contest in 2016. She is award-winning work, has appeared in the Blood Pudding Room, Quagmire, Waterwheel Review, Funicular, Wow Women in Writing, and many more. The first two chapters of her debut novel, What the Living Do, won the Lazal Group's Prose Contest and were published in Azure Magazine. She's a graduate of the Humber School for Writers. She's a certified Amherst Writers and Artist Workshop Facilitator, and she lives on a quiet river in traditional Ashinaogbe uh, territory on Williams Treaty land with an old assortment of humans and cats. What a great bio. Um, uh, Susan, this book sounds really fascinating. It, it's about sex and death, and it consumes much of this 37-year-old uh, Brett Catlin's life. Um, and she ends up having this, uh, what, association with Cole, who is 10 years her, her junior. Sounds like a really interesting book can you read something from us to give us a sense of what the book's all about sure i'd love to this is the very beginning when michelangelo peeled the skins of cadavers he was searching to uncover a mystery beyond how muscle attaches to bone in the dead i search for something beyond a tag to identify a dog's owner i clamp on my hard hat as mel eases the truck to a stop the dog at the roadside is a mixed breed with a delicate snout and brindled coat. A turkey vulture drops a rope of its intestine and lifts, lifts away into a hard blue sky. Overhead, the big bird carves a dark circle while Mel drags the shovel out of the truck bed. Even though I know the dog is dead, I squat to touch it, just in case. Its jaw gapes, its legs are stiff as branches, its milky eyes open, there's no tag. I touch a rib bone that pokes through the skin like a tire spoke. Was he abandoned or did he simply leave? The scent of wild things pulling him from the safety of home. Mel drives a boot onto the shovel's edge and begins to dig the hard packed summer dirt, releasing the scents of metal and stone. The only sounds are the steady rasp of Mel's breathing and the crunch of the shovel. We didn't bury my sister Goldie or my father. After the fire they brought two clay urns to the edge of the Kootenai River. The wind picked up the ash and bits of bone, casting them in a wide arc over the cold river. Before it settled, a gust of wind caught a handful and flung it into my mouth. When we slide the dog into the hole, its skull shows white through the split in its fur. This doesn't cause me to gag the way it used to. I still smell smoke though, whenever the dull moon of an eye lies exposed like this. Mel labors onto one knee and opens his fist, letting a confetti of tobacco drift over the small corpse. I keep my eyes on the still form while Mel lifts his head to intone a prayer. I hear Nimush and Miigwech, the Ojibwe words for dog and thank you. No, that's great. Thank you so much. <laughs> what a fascinating, but but kind of disturbing opening about roadkill. 
Why'd you decide to start your book this way? Oh, that's a great question. I, I, it was just about thinking about roadkill and how people would be like, I, I'd taken roadkill off the road, but you know, what if that was your job? You know, it was a, what if, what if that was your job? And what if you had this, uh, yearning to find out why why these things happen why the deaths of your family happen and every time you meet death i don't know it just i just thought that was such a great way to and and such a novel way also because you want to you want to have a character that's not the same as everybody you know don't secretary or a teacher or whatever you want something uh, and also it's it's a bit i wanted to flip the script on the male female roles I went to I went to the um, uh, outlet, whatever the um, where she worked in Barry, the the terminal where all and, and I asked the guys there, do you have women working here? Well, no, they said. I said, well, do women work here? Could they work here? Well, yeah, sure, but you know, <laughs> so I thought, mm hmm, what if they did? What would that be like? So there are scenes in the book where. You know, she's talking about them grabbing her ass and stuff like that. So I just, yeah, just thought it would be an interesting. And and why I started it like that? No, I just because we have a lot of turkey vultures around here. Turkey vultures. So Susan, you know, it's interesting that you say that this book is about so many different issues about uh, about uh, reproductive rights and sexuality and survivors' guilt. How is it about women's reproductive rights? How is it about women's productive, reproductive rights? Okay. <laughs> um, so she has a friend who is trying to get pregnant and keeps miscarrying. And then she tries to adopt. And that is a challenge. Um, Brett, the main character, has had an abortion. And that also weighs on her because she didn't want to. I don't know about rights so much as women's issues. Um, the pretty soon, pretty early on in the book, you find out that one of Brett's issues is that after the fire that claimed her family and her mother, who was still alive, was not very present, and she was living with her aunt and her mother, and. She has an older cousin, male, who essentially grooms her because she's very lost and he 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 pleasures her. He actually gives her a really beautiful experience, only she's 12 years old or whatever. So that's not right. So again, it's not reproductive rights. It's more about sexuality and what can happen, how an unhealthy sexual life can come from something that seems so beautiful if that makes sense to you i don't know really that that's that's an interesting topic so you said that it's about sexual grooming and how it causes confusion for a healthy sex life so exactly. this 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 sexual grooming was was it rape by the well you know i th i think probably legally it was called rape but he seduces her he makes her feel really good when she's lost and alone and lost her family. And he comes and makes her feel really good and really loved. Uh, so that, and he, what her first, her first idea that she carries into her adult life, that her first heartbreak was because of him, because when she reached Menarch, when she started to become a woman, he stopped making love with her. So for her, that was her first love. And it comes out much later and much later in the book. It reality, <laughs> reality catches up with her. Reality what? That 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 she was probably taken advantage of or, or... Yes. Yes, that maybe that wasn't what uh should have happened. And 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 I apologize, who was this? This was a relative? Yeah, it was her older cousin. He was in his twenties and she was twelve. And it went on for quite a while? It went on for about a year. Went on for a year, and 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 you're saying that this grooming is what is sexual grooming? Well, it's that it's getting getting a child ready for 
sex and giving them, making them feel good, making them feel wanted, making them feel special. And then you say it, it led to confusion um, uh, for a healthy sex life. How did that impact her? Well, well, I suppose she has a relatively healthy sex life in that she loves sex and, but she uses it. She uses it when she's distressed. She uses it when she's, you know, upset or things aren't going well. She's like, okay, but I mean, she's monogamous, but it's, you know, I'm feeling bad. Come and make love with me. Come on, let's, let's do this. And so her boyfriend sometimes feels a little bit used. And, and, and then you said the boyfriend is 10 years younger. What's, what's the storyline there? Uh, he, they met in a grocery store. He was a grocery store worker, also plays in a band. And um, so they met and they lived together. He's, um, he plays guitar with my, in my, um, I'm going to have in my launches, I'm going to have um, a guitar player playing the songs that he sings, which is kind of fun. Anyway, um, yeah, so they, they live together in Barrie, Ontario, and they, he, <clears throat> He loves her more than she allows him to, or, uh, you know, she, this is, this is the thing in, you were reading in one of the um, blurbs about, you know, maybe she'll learn to love because she uses him to feel better about herself. So she feels kind of um, a little bit above him. So, so that's, was that's she, the formative was she, line through the story. Was she using him the same way that her older cousin used her? Well, no, because he's a grown up and and he's also we find out in the book, he's surprisingly aware of what she's up to, but he adores her. And and you write a lot of uh, of very sexy passages, I understand. Yeah, I'm not going to read. Them. <laughs> what? Um, uh, yeah, not not a lot, but but they're they're I mean, they're lyrically written. They're not they're not it's not porn. It's not porn. It's not Fifty Shades. No, no, but but it's it's fairly graphic, but um, but it's tasteful. What motivated you to write all these sexy scenes? I love writing sex scenes. A lot of people, a lot of writers back away from them. They kind of pan out the window, kind of thing. Uh, but I, I just because I think it really shows a relationship. In this case, it definitely shows a relationship and how the arc of the relationship. Um, you know, with the, the times when he says, hey, no, but just let's let's take care of this. You know, she's like, I've got cancer. Make love to me. I feel bad. And he's like, wait a minute. Hold on. So um, in that way, it, it shows the, the, the way that the, the relationship moves from not exactly unhealthy, but a little dysfunctional, a little Im unbalanced, I think, would be the best way to, to say that. Sounds like a fascinating book. Uh, we're going to, what's it called again? What the Living Do. What the Living Do. Uh, and, and, and I understand that a lot of it is also about uh, survivor's remorse. We're going to take a break and, uh, and come back uh, with Susan Wides and talk a little bit about survivor's remorse and what it is and, and how she writes about it. Stay with us, everyone. Back in just two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Susan Watts. She is a author, and her stunning new novel, What the Living Do, uh, is being published early in March, and it grapples with uh, women's reproductive rights and sexuality, as well as survivor's uh, guilt. Uh, here's a little synopsis of the book. Sex and death consume much of the 30-year-old uh, Brett Catlin's life. Uh, Cole is 10 years, uh, her junior, takes care of her the former uh, person, um, uh, uh, Brett, while her job disposing of roadkill addresses uh, the latter. A cancer diagnosis causes her to question her worth, suspecting the illness is payback for the death of her father and mother. Thus begins a challenging journey of alternative healing that she doubts she deserves. Just as Brett surrenders to the prescribed cure, a startling discovery sends her for a more profound exploration of cause and effect. Encounters with animals, both living and dead, help her answer the question, who is worth living? Wow, fascinating. So tell me, what's survivor's remorse? It should have been me. You know, that feeling that whoever 
the, the one that dies, that the person feels, no, that should have been me that died. So in her case, in Brett's case, um, she, her, her, her sister was only three and she used to climb into bed with her for comfort, but Brett, as a young girl, 11, 10, would kick her out of bed. And this night that the fire happened, she kicked her out of bed and the little girl went and hid in the closet. So when the fire broke out, her father came in, grabbed her, took her out, and then went back in to get the little sister. Um, so the sister died in the fire and the father died later from smoke inhalation. But that guilt in her case was because she felt responsible for both deaths because one, she made the little sister leave and then the father had to go back in and get her. So. So so she suffers from this feeling that it should have been her, that she was responsible. How did she uh, deal with it? That, well, um, in the beginning, because she was very young, she dealt with it by allowing <laughs> allowing her, her cousin to take care of her. Um, but I think what she, how she dealt with it throughout her life was becoming quite tough, toughened. Um, not not really letting anyone in because evidently she wasn't worthy of being loved. And then she uh, got cervical cancer, you say, and she felt that uh, initially that her promiscuity was uh, to the cause of, of her cervical cancer. Is, is that the case? Yeah. Um, two of the things, she'd had a few lovers. She wasn't really promiscuous, but she'd had a few lovers, but also the, these flyers, they tell you that um, early sexual relations are one of the causes of this particular kind of cervical cancer because the body hasn't really adjusted to um, accept <laughs> that sort of thing. And um, so again, she feels that this is the reason, oh, so it's my fault. Um, it's my fault for every reason. It's my fault because you know I killed my family and 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 I and I enjoyed sex. so. I'm just wrong and I should die. And then, and then, as you say, she, she, she comes to this uh, conclusion that it's karma, that it's because of her, uh, her, her family dying, that, that, that what the illness is God's way of getting back or karma's way of getting back. Yeah, exactly. And how does she deal with that? How does she deal with that is a good question. She, she first of all feels that she's just going to let that happen. She's going to move to Bali. That's her idea. She's going to move to Bali and just die in a beautiful place. <clears throat> death is celebrated there. So she'll go celebrate death. And somehow that will, she, she has this idea that this will somehow, I don't know, give her sister, her sister and her father that she'll be able to pay it back somehow by having a beautiful. Sort of atone for, uh, for what she did wrong. If she did something wrong. Yeah, and also somehow to send to 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 give it back to her father and and sister by by having a beautiful death that she'll take them with her. So that's her first idea. But her boyfriend doesn't think that's such a great idea. <laughs> doesn't think that that's probably what she should do. And so she tries some mm -hmm. alternative healing. She does some alternative healing, um, and these are things that I tried myself: various juicing and fasting and coffee enemas and all kinds of uh, things like that, uh, which don't really work. And um, they kind of work, but they don't cure it. And um, ultimately, she does decide to go the traditional route and have a hysterectomy. But then she finds something out. But you have to read the book to find out what that is. The startling discovery. So you're <laughs> not going to tell me what the startling discovery is. <laughs> no, I can't. It's too far into the book for me to tell you. <laughs> and a profound exploration of cause and effect. Yeah. yeah. That's that's what the book's about. How'd you get into writing? Oh, um, I've always written um, since I was a teenager. <laughs> I wrote my first book at, I was 17. Yeah, 17. And I <laughs> had this very romantic idea. I went to Quebec City. My parents let me, if you can believe that take a train, go to Quebec City, take a little uh, pension and write my first novel called Revival of a Dead Widowed. 
and I knew nothing about writing. <laughs> but I wrote this entire novel by hand uh, in my little garret in old Quebec. So yeah, I just, stories have always taken me and I just wanted to make them. So I did. And uh, I've got to ask you, you don't have to answer, but I got to ask, given that uh, the cervical cancer uh, is something that you experienced yourself, is the sexual grooming something you experienced yourself? Um, I, no, I don't think so. I mean, who knows? I like sex, but I don't, <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't, I don't have any, mem let's put it this way. I don't have any memory of being groomed in that way. Okay. Um, and the, uh, the alternative health is something you experienced yourself. Yeah. Lots more than is in the book. I went to, I went to India to, and I spent six months in intense alternative healing. And do you have survivor guilt from something personally? No, I made so that. That. Was, that you that you made up. Okay, interesting. Um, you know, it sounds like a, an absolutely fascinating and interesting book. I look forward to uh, to reading it. Um, when you write about things that are personal experiences, you've got a good source of material. When you write things that aren't uh, personal experience, how do you how do you do that? Do you do research and go visit the 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 Department of Transportation where they pick up the roadkill or like what do you like how do you write about sexuality that you haven't experienced how do you do that um yeah research uh there was uh there's a lovely man named Paul that was uh, uh the father of a client of mine that uh actually let me come and sit in a snowplow because that's there's a lot of scenes where she's driving the snowplow so he kind of gave me the so that was part of the research. Yes, I went to the yard to check out the trucks. I have the whole bunch of pictures, um, talked to the guys. I stopped guys on the road that were doing roadkill and just chatted to them about, you know, where do you put them? You know, do you, do you take them somewhere? Well, when they're big, like a deer, they do take them to uh, a, sometimes just to the dump, which is horrible. Um, but usually they drag them off. They might, and as you heard in the, first chapter there they they dig a hole so yeah research research absolutely and you, you mentioned in uh, what you wrote uh, to me that there's other books that have similar themes do you like read other books um to get ideas or oh um well okay so one of the things that uh i one of the comps uh, the comparable titles that i offered was um Alyssa york's fauna because it there, there's that's another one of the themes of this book are the are the animals themselves and indigenous um her partner Brett's partner in this is um is indigenous he's from Rama close by oh that's okay remind me to say something about that so there's a lot of animal lore and animal um teachings that he gives her so that when they encounter certain animals there's a teaching there for her for instance um a big one is actually skunks. So here's the story. And this is, I love this story because my ex-husband is Ojibwe from Rama and we have a son. And they're one of their great, great grandmothers, great, great Spanish flu time here in Rama uh, told her husband to, to go and trap a skunk. This is, I love this story so much. And so she made a tea from the, the tang, the, the liquid poison, and made everyone in the family drink it, and no one got sick. So my ex-husband used to say, whenever you smell skunk, breathe it in. It's really healing. Really? So I do. I do that. I don't know if it's true, but I do it all the time. Whenever I smell skunk, it's like, uh, I breathe it in. So, so that is one of the things that this character does is whenever she sees a skunk or, or encounters one, she's constantly, because of what Mel, her partner, told her, she's thinking that maybe the skunk is going to cure her. Anyway, so uh, the quest back to the question, Alyssa York's fauna, her, her story turns on encounters with animals, and it's beautiful. But uh, the reason I mentioned the other books is because they've come out long since I finished writing this book. One is My Dark Vanessa, which is, has to do with the grooming. And she's a little bit older. She's, I think, 15 or something, but she gets groomed by a teacher 
who makes her feel really special. Um, and I thought, oh, and that's a, quite a new book. That's a, a recent book. And uh, then there's All the Ugly and Wonderful Things by Bryn Greenwood, which, which is a really disturbing book about a very uh, dispossessed little girl who falls in love with a, a man in his 20s and basically pursues him. So those were books that had similar themes to them, but they weren't books that inspired me. They were books that I was just delighted to find after I wrote the book. I mean, after the book is actually published and I'm like, oh my God, these are great comparable titles. And if we come to one of these uh, uh, launches or uh, or readings that you have, you say there's going to be a guitarist playing some music. Uh, what else is going to happen? Are you going to read a section of the book? I will. Uh, so for the first two in Aurelia and in Toronto, uh, Richard Scrimger will be introducing me. And after I do a short reading, we'll have a, a discussion about all kinds of things writing wise. Uh, and yeah, there'll be a guitar player. And um, who else? In Uxbridge, Ruth Walker, not, um, author of Living Underground. She's, she and I will be in a discussion after a short reading. And uh, Joanne Cully will be talking to me in Peterborough. So yeah, there'll be you know a lively discussion about writing type things, um, some things about the book, but I think also just about the whole life of a writer. Um, well, maybe we should turn to that uh, after we take a final break and uh, you can turn and maybe share some things about uh, life as a writer and uh, suggestions for people on what they should uh, think about doing if they ever dreamt about writing a book themselves. Stay with us, everyone. We'll be back in just two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm chatting tonight with Susan Wadge. She is an author who has uh, written... Uh, what's been described as a fierce and fearless novel about a woman drawn to self-destruction yet desperate to live and maybe uh, and maybe even love. A deeply moving and memorable debut novel by Susan Watts. Um, and the novel is called What the Living Do. And it's about sexuality. It's about uh, uh, sexual grooming. It's about survivor's guilt. Uh, it's about roadkill. Um, it's about alternative medicine. It's about cervical cancer. Um, it's about sex. Um, and it's about love. Uh, and in the end, it's about who is worth saving. Sounds like a really interesting, fascinating book. I hope I get a copy of it uh, uh, and I can read it. Um, Susan, you said at one of these sessions, we're going to talk, you're going to talk uh, uh, with another author about a writer's life and uh, some suggestions about uh, writing. Tell us what what a writer's life is like and what suggestions you've got about writing. My biggest suggestion is to find a supportive writing group to write with. One of the biggest things that we encounter the difficulty is not so much writer's block, but writer's resistance. <laughs> Keeping your bum in the chair and keeping the keeping the hands moving. Um, so, what really helped me to get deeply into the world of creating something was Amherst Writers and Artists' method of writing workshop facilitation. It's generative writing, it's prompted writing. But what is really beautiful about the process is that when feedback is given it's first and foremost what's memorable and strong in a piece of work as opposed to what needs fixing or <laughs> what's wrong with it. So it gives the writer confidence to know that there's always a nugget of gold in something that they write. And to tell you the truth, this book was written almost exclusively. Each scene, I can identify each scene, how it started in a writing workshop. So it's it's really quite brilliant that you can write whatever you want. The prompts are very wide open, so you can write as you please. But you can also go in, as I did, with a, the intention of using the prompts to generate work for your work in progress. So having having beta readers is great. Having but really having a writing community just keeps us writing. Excellent. Um, I appreciate that. So a writer's workshop type event is helpful. Um, do you write 
some people say they wake up at four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning right early. Other people say you just got to put eight hours in. What what was the secret for you? Eight hours. Oh, my goodness. Um, I, I like to write in the morning. I'm much better in the morning than I am at night. Uh, and I think I think if 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 you go across the board, you'll find that most writers dedicate about four hours a day. Four hours of intense writing will definitely keep you going. I write every morning from Monday to Friday with a group called Pajama Writing, led by Sue Reynolds, which is a lovely hour of silent writing. We come in a few minutes early, we can have a little chat, but then for one hour, it's silent writing in community. Nobody's talking to anybody, but we're all there. Sometimes we're 40 people on the screen. And this only happened because of because of COVID, of course, just as this is. And um, so after the hour, you might put a sentence or a phrase or a little passage of what you've just written up in the chat, and then people make comments about it. Anyway, the point is that every morning from Monday to Friday, I write for at least one hour right there. So that gets me going. That, that's my little secret. I think everybody has their own pattern. Are you excited about this uh, novel launch? Oh, I'm out of my brain. Yes. <laughs> I finished this book in 2015. I uh, had an agent, a New York agent for a while who couldn't sell it. I had a lot of nice feedback from various agents, but they didn't take it. I almost got in with the big five, but then there was a big shuffle and they dropped it. So, it, you know, it's been a long journey. <laughs> to finally uh, find Regal House who who loved the book and and wanted to wanted to back it. So uh, yeah, I'm thrilled. And even then Regal House accepted it in October of 2021. And now it's being launched. So it's been a long road. Takes a long time. And uh, and your publicist uh, that contacted me is very, very uh, positive about it and thinks you're incredibly riveting is the word she used to describe you. She's great. Oh my God. I, if that's another piece of advice I would give writers, not people who finished their pieces is to, is to get a publicist and to get Holly because she's amazing. She's really working hard. Excellent. Well, Susan, it's been a, a pleasure to meet you. Um, remind us the name of the book. What the living do. And which it comes, is out comes from a poem uh, by Dorian Knox. And it comes out in early March, March 19th. And people can buy it. They can buy it at Amazon. It's available in paperback or digital. And they can buy it from Regal House directly uh, if you're in the U.S. Uh, Susan, I really appreciate you joining us. You know, it's been an interesting um, discussion about not only your book, but about some of the topics that are raised in your book. And uh, and given that uh, February 12th to the 16th is... Uh, uh, sexual health week i think it is uh appropriate that we uh we chatted about uh your book uh what the living do uh by susan wads uh available early march thanks everybody thanks susan that's my show for tonight thank you everyone for joining us i remind you i'm on every monday through friday at six o'clock on 9 60 a.m you can stream me online from anywhere in the world including uh up north in in, in ontario at www.saga960am.ca all my podcasts and videos are available on my website briancrombie.com my podcasts are on a whole bunch of different podcast uh, uh outlets and my videos are on social media linkedin um facebook instagram and youtube thanks for joining me everybody Thank you, Susan. Good night.